And we, we've got another one that that's comes by that uh, he's a bad birder. We have to chase him away because he yeah. goes after birds all the time. And every time we see him, he's got another one of these little bird scare collars on him, but he loses them pretty quick. Okay. Is that those big, uh, colorful collars? That yeah, scare big me? things that stick out, yeah. <laughs> but he doesn't leave them on very long. <laughs> okay. Hey, everybody. Good. Good. Randy, what's, you get the behind, shirt? what's behind you there? <clears throat> it's just for my collection. I don't know. <laughs> A moon. stuffy moon. <laughs> it's a pretty strange looking moon. I, uh, it, it actually looks like a barbecue pork bun. Kind of. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> with, with, with eyes. eyes. <laughs> with eyes, yeah. <laughs> oh, you've never had them with, without the eyes? <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Hey, Brock. Well, hey, Brock. it's pretty early in the election, but Green is leading in one. I wonder where that is. It's not in British Columbia. Huh. Are they allowed to show results before the polls close? Oh, in these godless times, Dave. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that law was struck yeah. down. We we went through that at the with the last election. And yeah. the, the answer <laughs> went from no to yes. Was it just last election? Yeah, yeah. previous to that, they were they were pretty strict about it, but they seem to have given up. Okay, I thought it was uh, 2015 that they gave it up. Maybe, maybe you're right. CBC projects a liberal government. Yes, I see that. Interesting. Minority or majority? Oh, okay. well, yeah, I don't think they will have a plurality. Yet, but, uh, Too early to tell, I guess. Eh? Yeah. Hey, at least the elections went here went better than they do south of the border, eh? <laughs> That's not <laughs> <I don't> <laughs> We, we lined up to cast, cast a ballot at one of the local churches, and uh, it was very civilized. People were having a nice little chat, and uh, yeah. they, everybody was walking around with their dogs to get pats and it was fair everybody everybody wearing masks every single one of them no uh, kerfuffles okay. it took a while to find it on the map but the uh, green lead is in kitchener center at the moment oh, oh. i guess oh. i guess canadians days, yeah. <laughs> i guess canadians are just inherently more tolerant <laughs> yeah we're, we're cla we're cla classically like classically polite. Yeah. Except in Alberta. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm in Alberta. <laughs> I don't think well, not everybody in Alberta is a redneck. <laughs> there are some astronomers. They're okay. Yeah. <laughs> Depends if you live in uh, Calgary or Edmonton, from what I understand. Yeah, yeah Edmonton, <laughs> isn't it, John? <laughs> There's a certain degree of that. The closer you get to the border, the more you get the right winger, your ex rancher mentalities. Hey, careful. I used to be on an acreage. <laughs> oh, it's different between an acreage owner and a rancher. A rancher who thinks he owns all the land that his cows can walk on. <laughs> and if you've been in Alberta, you would understand that with respect to how the government deals with grazing leases. I was yeah, born I in Alberta that. and my parents escaped when I was young. So. <laughs> oh, it's a lovely place. So is it going to clear off tonight? It's looking like it might. So. Oh, oh, right it, was, cloudy, it, was, cloudy. it was semi clear last night. I, um, I was out for six hours, um, but I was covered in dew by the time I came in at three. Yeah. You got until six three, hours up God. there. I yeah, until three. I only yeah, spent right. an hour, but it was really lovely. 
Yeah. It was really nice, bright and clear moon last night down here in Cadbury Bay. But it's yeah. looking pretty, pretty uh, gray tonight. It is. I'm suggesting yeah. the um, cloud pattern should hold for the evening. So kind of what we've got now looks like is what we're going to get. But we'll see. Oh. It's going to be. I think, I think Wednesday is supposed to be better. I overcast tonight. I think. Yeah. I I need a night in between nights. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I can't. I I don't function. One one of the pictures I'm I'm going to show you today was taken in the early evening uh, at the Northern Prairie Star Party, uh, just in the first couple of hours that it started to get dark. And it's pretty impressive. You'll see it later. What was your target, David, last night? I had homework to do. Yeah, I, I had right. all the calibration frames to make, and I I finally picked um, a variable to look at uh, on the weekend, um, SS uh, uh, SIG. Uh, unfortunately, I got a little bit uh, stymied with uh, alignment, and I was already starting at Zenith, and it was heading into the tree that's next door. <laughs> so I didn't have much time, so I had to well, fortunately, I was using a Sequence Generator Pro. I, I could make some choices. I had actually pre-scheduled all the shots. And I thought, okay, I can do flats. I can do darks later. I'm going to do the I'm going to do the science images now. So I just quickly moved. I canceled all the sequences that weren't weren't like that. Went right to the science images, caught them, and then I went backwards after that. And that was fine because I didn't have to track out. I didn't have to track after that. Rises from 12th magnitude to 8th magnitude for one to two days every seven or eight weeks. Yep. Wow. Yep. So if I if I get out uh, more often in the next month or so, I'm going to capture. Maybe I might be able to capture the whole curve. I don't know. I'll but see. if you've got Sequence Generator Pro, why don't you just go to bed? I can't leave my equipment out out in the in the burb. <laughs> it's oh. just on your driveway, right? It's on the it's front, just on my it's driveway, the front yeah. yard. And, 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 not, and, not only, <laughs> and not only that, it's quite it's quite humorous because I set up a light stand right at the end of the driveway to block the light from the light standard at the end of the driveway. So it it stands about maybe about 15 feet tall and has a very large black umbrella at the end of it, and it blocks all the light, creates an umbra for me right below the umbrella. This is perfect. Nice. Like Mary Poppins. Yeah, kind of like that. There's a time series going all the way back to 1900. Yeah. Uh, another uh, computer, another human computer uh, discovered that one. I can't remember her name now, but uh, uh, it's attributed to uh, SS SIG is attributed to that as well by Harvard. Louisa D. Wells. There you go. 1896. That's awesome. So for all you uh, astrophotography enthusiasts, did you see that Canon has released their new R3 camera? Oh, wow. More money. 24.1 mm -hmm. megapixel mirrorless camera, full frame CMOS, in body image stabilization. Um, what else did you say here? High quality with High image quality with back illuminated stack 24.1 megapixel full frame sensor. For the mere price, according to Henry's, of $8,000. Oh, mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> that's a bit pricey, isn't it? <laughs> Let's have a couple of them and send it off, send one off and get a uh, Well, it's the modded one will be double probably. I think yeah. it's their replacement for the 1DS. So it's yeah. the top, top of the line camera. Yeah, are people are are people sneaking in inflation there too? I mean, I'm just wondering if yeah, oh, a I lot would, of the new gear is coming up with higher pricing, anyways. I wouldn't doubt. Simply, well, they're probably having to pay a whole lot more for chips these days. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. So how are we doing for time? Oh, it's about twenty-five two. So maybe I'll just check around and see who. Um, we have on the list um john mcdonald had something from last week that we didn't get to did you still want to do that tonight i think you're still muted there yes i could do something 
Okay, so I think we had what David. Ben, uh, yep, yep. My, Nathan, my, 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 my. Reg, uh, John, and some Edmonton photos. How does that sound? Yep. Anybody else? Okay. So if uh, we got two Johns now. Yeah. <laughs> two, two Davids. Two Davids, yeah. Yeah, please. We've got, we've got an extra John I've got, yeah. got something on the other computer that I want to show you. Okay. And it's funny, only one of them is looking at us at the other time. The other oh, yeah, one is looking are. away. <laughs> so anyways, yeah, so maybe uh, uh, welcome to uh, Astro Cafe for uh, September 20th and uh, interesting election day. So um, without further ado, because I think... Um, We'll probably have um, maybe some fewer number of people tonight because I know certainly at least one person told me they were going to be watching election results and not joining us. So that's uh, I was just devastated to hear that. But uh, <laughs> I'm glad the rest of you decided to show up, <laughs> anyways. And um, so, David, do you think you're going to take us away? Right. So um, we got some sad news uh, last week. Um, a face from the past, I guess. Um, this is actually from a former time, I guess, in a lot of ways. Um, uh, at a time when we actually did meet at star parties and events. And uh, it really wasn't that long ago. But uh, um, I first met, met uh, Ed, uh, oh yeah, it must about, uh, oh, maybe about 15, 20 years ago, I guess. Um, uh, he was a, working for the Coast Guard at the time. But he was a, a constant fixture at uh, various uh, various places. Um, uh, he spent most of his time with the Cowichan Starfinders. Uh, this is a, a group that's just uh, just up from us, uh, mostly focused around Mill Bay Duncan, I, I believe. And we certainly shared a lot of events with them uh, in the past as well. And maybe we'll, certainly we'll hope to do that in the future as well. So um, this is a picture of Ed uh, at one of the AGMs, this is in 2011, and uh, you'll recognize a lot of faces here, and I warn you, you will see pictures of me with hair uh, in subsequent pictures here, so don't be too shocked. So um, Island Star Party, uh, one of the events that we used to always do before we went uh, to Machosan and uh, various places. Uh, this is, um, I think this is up at the Fish and Wildlife Club, I think. This is up over the Malahat. And you can see Ed there and other people that you probably recognize as well. And um, we had an event in 2002 up at the Hill. Uh, this is uh, Sophie Louis, uh, who's now in Vancouver now, but she was with Czech TV at the time. Um, she's uh, interviewing Ed. And I think this is a partial solar that we were at, partial solar eclipse. And uh, I always remember Ed's uh, ETX. And there's me with more hair, uh, many, many pounds later as well. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure you'll recognize yourselves there. I mean, Joe, there's Joe and there's yeah. uh, Ed sitting down there. This is up at uh, Pearson. So uh, this is a, uh, Weir's haunt and uh, they certainly have had uh, a kind of a, a really nice uh, getaway uh, for uh, night observing yeah so I don't I don't know if there's any other people that um, kind of want to share any other moments but uh, I, I certainly remember Ed as kind of a kind and gentle soul he um, certainly um, uh, spent a lot of time with outreach uh, uh, events with us, you know, in the time, even though it seems so long ago now. But uh, yeah, yeah. So here's the ad for sure. Thank you. Thanks for putting that together, David. Yeah, no problem. Um, okay. Somebody wrote that he was a fixture at the mirror grinding sessions yeah yes, this is Sandy the, Barda was uh yeah exactly and, and told us about that uh on facebook and uh, he was of course also an early fixture in the uh astronomy cafe when she held it out there 
And yeah, so, so that, I, posted it as well. yeah, I, I, I don't know if people know this, but the, this manifestation of cafe comes from um, quite a humble uh, uh, kind of a uh, beginning in uh, Sandy Barger's uh, kind of uh, home on Plowright uh, in the Royal. And then I kind of navigated to Bruno's place for a little while and then uh, we found this place. But uh, that spans uh, many kind of many decades now. Great. Okay, uh, Nathan, are you ready? Uh, yeah, I am. Please carry so, on. Yeah, okay. Um, this isn't a new feeling that I had, but just two days ago, I was reading about the largest black hole ever discovered. And I was like, oh man, we are so small. Now that wasn't a new feeling, obviously. Like I've been feeling small ever since I was started being interested in space, like when I was three. Yeah, okay. I was actually small back then. And I stayed small just because of how big the universe was. So I decided that since the only comparisons of the universe that we ever see are like panning videos where it starts, um, on one side and then it basically just zooms out. Um, it kind of doesn't quite give the whole perspective because objects leave the video pretty quickly. Um, so you can't really compare things to one another, but I decided to put some things in a single image to help give a sense of how big this black hole is compared to our tiny little earth. Um, so I guess I could start with, um, this is just something I put together to show the size of our planet. Um, all right, I'll start with this. So if it looks pixelated, that's because it is, because I had to find a really high resolution background to put it on just to fit it all in one and Earth was right at the bottom. So it's pretty pixelated. Um, now, uh, Earth is this little dot here. Um, and yeah, Earth is one of the potentially habitable planet candidates, I think, according to some space agencies. <laughs> and then here's Earth compared to Neptune. And Neptune is really underrated, I gotta say. Like everyone just thinks of it as being like the outcast, but it's the more exciting of the two ice giants. Because if you went there, you'd actually have something to look at before you froze to death. Then there's Uranus, which is the slightly more boring version of the ice giants, because um, you wouldn't really have much to look at if you arrived at the surface, which there isn't in the atmosphere. Um, so yeah, Earth is getting a, a little smaller now. Uh, there's Saturn with the rings um, and Jupiter. And then we get into the stars. Here's Proxima Centauri. And I think they called it that because, you know, Alpha Centauri C, that just sounds like you're just adding an extra star because that would really like um, undermine its specialty if you just called it Alpha Centauri C. It's like, oh, it's another Alpha Centauri. Uh, then there's Barnard's star. Um, and here's Earth way back here. And here's the sun, a pretty important star in my opinion, one we should probably keep. And then we move on to the bigger stars, like Sirius and Vega, which is, I think it's uh, one of the stars that's gonna be the North Star in a few thousand years. And it's gonna look a lot more exciting than Polaris. That's for sure, magnitude zero. And here's Earth back here, if you can still see it. Um, and then we get onto some even bigger ones like Bellatrix. Now that I think about it, a lot of Harry Potter characters are stars um, for non-Harry Potter fans, I'm sorry. Then there's Pollux and I feel like, I think this is actually my star, right? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, me and my mom are both Gemini and we've kind of both assigned ourselves a star and I think this is mine. Um, Earth is less than a pixel here uh, but there's still more. This one, the black hole at the center of our galaxy. I don't know if you get the joke here. Um, this is actually part of its name, but 
I really don't know what the asterisk is for if they're trying to hide something from us. It's actually pronounced Sagittarius A star, but it's not a star, it's a black hole. So I don't know what's with that. Anyway, then there's these two really big stars. Um, Beta Centauri, which I feel like most people haven't heard that because you know Alpha Centauri just takes all the credit. Um, but yeah, there's a Beta Centauri too, and it's honestly a lot more exciting. <laughs> I mean, that's way cooler. It's so huge. Uh, and then there's Arcturus. Um, so yes, Arcturus compared to our tiny sun and Earth, which is no longer visible. And yeah, by this point, you should probably be feeling, I don't know, maybe a little smaller. Okay, now let's um, take Arcturus here. And now this is Arcturus, the biggest one of the last slide. And uh, yeah, it's a, um, a big star. And then as we move on, we get to Aldebaran, um, which is in the brightest star in Taurus, and Rigel, which, I mean, it's Orion's foot, which it doesn't sound as cool as the shoulder, but, you know, I think it's still worth mentioning. Then there's Deneb, which is um, another North Star, a future North Star, um, voted most likely to succeed. And then uh, Rho Cassiopeia, I think uh, this is like one of the rarest types of stars because it's a uh, yellow hypergiant and most stars that get that big don't actually look very yellow. They are just like a deep red color. Sorry, Nathan. Yeah. Um, I'm not seeing anything past Arcturus on your screen. Maybe oh. it's just me, but it's just black. Is it, is, is I'm the, am I the only one or is everybody else oh. seeing it? No, I'm not seeing it either. Maybe it's a different file. I, 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 see first to Deneb. I see Deneb. I see Deneb. Okay. Um, huh. Hang on. I'm just going to restart the share. Oh, here we go. Uh. Okay. Well, um, I mean, most of the time when you see these comparisons, right, oh, right. right. Uh, these stars are the ones that take up the entire screen, but, um, you know, on this scale, they really don't. <laughs> um, there's Betelgeuse, the one star that basically no one can claim to not have heard of. Um, and then this star here uh, used to be the largest star and was the largest star that people um, thought ever existed for a long time. My life has kind of been divided into three sections, the age of VY Canis Majoris being on top, then UY study, and recently this one, Stevenson 218, um, now officially the top of stars at least. Um, yeah, so this is the largest star ever discovered and it's how, still pretty- how big, how big can you make that? I mean, do you have a, a dimension for it? In um, suns? Yeah, it's 2,150 times wider than the sun. So that helps. If, if Earth were orbiting this star, from our perspective, we would be three quarters to the center. <laughs> As in um, three quarters of the star would be above us, yeah. which isn't necessarily a good thing for the planet's overall habitability. So, so is it like the... the Orbit of Jupiter or more like Saturn? It's yeah. past the orbit of Saturn. It's past. Mm -hmm. It's Please. really huge. And yet there are black holes bigger than it, like Cygnus A. Now Cygnus A is the black hole listed on the Toronto University Starfinder chart, which makes it look like it's a star. It's a night sky target that you can actually see. And I've had several people um, at star parties way back when asking, hey, um, can you show me Cygnus A? I, uh. I think the star finder makes it look like it's like a visible thing, but obviously never been able to see it. Then there's Messier 84, and it made me wonder 
where uh, if there was a, a messiest 84. <laughs> anyway, uh, these are getting pretty big. And this is like the Schwarzschild radius is this big. So it, if this was the density of like a star, I don't even know how big they'd be. Um, and then there's this one. Um, we're still only in the supermassive black hole range. And I think Hercules is a really suiting name for this one, but it's still dwarfed by the one that we recently, sorry, yeah, the Event Horizon Telescope recently. Sorry, I'm sounding like I'm doing all this. <laughs> the one that we recently took a picture of, um, which means we can basically say anything about it. Um, it's the scariest black hole we've imaged so far. It's also the least scary black hole we've imaged so far. I think scary is very appropriate. Only scary there. if you get near it. Mm -hmm. um, the solar system at this scale is about this wide. Um, so if this replaced the sun, um, all the planets would be inside the event horizon and probably Voyager 1 would be too. It's like that pale blue dot image is like black. <laughs> that monstrous black circle image. And lastly, there is this one, that huge black hole. Um, this is, I don't know how to describe it really, like just how huge this is. Um, this is about 10 times wider than the solar system. And this is basically the largest black hole ever discovered. I'm just kidding, there's one more, the one that I was talking about. This one here is the largest. Oh. It is a hyperluminous quasar. And you know how, how the sun looks compared to some of those big stars? Well, those big stars look like the sun compared to the big stars compared to this. Um, I did a bit of um, calculations on if this were to replace the sun. I mean, actually, it's pretty simple what would happen if this replaced the sun. Everything in the solar system would be accelerating towards it at faster than the speed of light. Uh, but if this replaced Alpha Centauri, it would appear as large as the moon in the sky, even at a distance of 4.1 light years. Oh, geez. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty scary to think about. Um, and it's a hyperluminous quasar. So it's not just um, like it's not just doing its own thing sitting in space. It's consuming so much matter that it's um, producing X-ray beams, kind of like a double-edged Death Star, shooting it going. Um, and it's so bright that if it were, um, if this were the core of the Andromeda galaxy, it would be 10 times brighter than Venus looks in our sky. If this were the center of our own Milky Way, it would be as bright as the full moon in the sky. And if this were at the distance that Alpha Centauri is, it would act like a second sun. It actually would be brighter than the sun. It would basically produce day, daylight on Earth, even at a distance of four light years. Um, yeah, I. Sometimes it's nicer not to think about just what's out there in the universe. <laughs> and where is it? Where is it and how far? Luckily, it's 13.1 billion light years away. And even at that distance, it's bright enough to see through a Dobsonian telescope, which is really freaky. I've never actually seen it. Um, it's old. It's old. But yeah. It's probably even bigger than this, just because in that 13.1 billion years, um, since yeah. we're only seeing light from it 13.1 billion years ago, it's probably gotten a lot bigger. So it's probably spinning at a heck of a rate too. Yeah, well, even if it was spinning at the speed of light, it would take over three weeks to rotate. So. <laughs> <laughs> There's the number that gets you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's this thing is pretty insane. Uh, anyway, that is my um, 
thought provoking size diminishing view of the objects in the universe. Thank you. Thank you. We so know much. Nathan how big the the black hole is compared to the event horizon. Do we know that? Um, well, the singularity is still infinitely small, but uh, the event horizon, well, this circle here is the event horizon. And compared to even the largest star we've ever discovered, I mean, this thing is huge. But it can't be a singularity, surely. Well, what else? A definition. I mean, if it was rotating, it would be a ringularity. Um, huh. Well, yeah. Yeah, what you're seeing is the is the event horizon for the black hole, the singularity. <clears throat> mm -hmm. All right. Um, yeah, I guess that's it. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Nathan. That was illuminating and beautiful. <laughs> Elegant. Yeah, I'm glad I could shed some light on that topic. Elegant. That's neat, Nathan. Thank I you, enjoyed Nathan. that. Uh, just one comment. I I agree with you. It's fun pointing out to people that when we have star parties about the North Star and that it's going to change, Polaris won't always be our <laughs> North Star. But it's fun to point out that we have now and can show them a double star there and the difference in magnitudes of the of Polaris and its companion is pretty striking and and easily visible from the CAO whenever we get up there again. Mm -hmm. Interesting oh, talk. One other comment about the North Star. Uh, you mentioned that Vega will be the North Star in uh, I don't know how many thousand years. The, at the same time, the South Star will be Canopus, the second brightest star in the entire star, a sky. Yeah, it's their right. anti-portal. <laughs> So uh, whatever um, ships that are navigating by those ancient techniques in 3,000 years <laughs> will finally have good stars to navigate with. Yeah, go back to the old, old days when yeah, Canopus was it. used <laughs> very long ago. Thank you again. Um, Reg, I believe you wanted to tell us something about. Okay. Um, I'll just share the screen. And I guess I share the desktop, do I? Yeah, that should work best, I think. And I'm trying to. But we got your email, which I don't think you want us to look yeah, at. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, what I'd like to talk to you about is uh, some stuff on M33. I am having problems here. It's blocking. Everything is being blocked on my screen right now. I can't make me go away. We see it. Yeah, but I can't see it. Oh. <laughs> okay, I'll just go ahead. Well, you already know it. Uh, okay, uh, why M33? Um, uh, I, I did saw a talk uh, about two years ago in the olden days when it was uh, at uh, the um, uh, Fairfield Community Center, but I just wanted to update it with some stuff here. So uh, M33 uh, was uh, rediscovered by uh, Messier in 1764. It's our second closest spiral galaxy. Cepheroid variables were seen in it in 1923, and they enabled us to determine the distance. It's 2.7 million light years. And um, uh, the uh, gravity, uh, so it's slightly farther away than Andromeda. And um, uh, uh, it's uh, in gravitational interaction with Andromeda, and it has one of the largest uh, uh, hydrogen alpha reg uh, regions uh, uh, known. And um, in uh, 1959, uh, uh, the uh, Dutch uh, astronomer Louise Volders 
uh, showed through uh, radio telescopes that uh, the uh, galactic rotation was unusual. And this was followed up by Vera Rubin uh, from 1973 to 81. And she showed that um, as you uh, go out from the center of a galaxy, uh, you expect that the rotation rate of the star is going to, uh, the galaxy is going to drop off. But uh, from starlight and then hydrogen alpha, for uh, this is a picture of M33 right here, um, uh, that uh, actually it increased. And uh, this caused all sorts of uh, grief and, and presented a strong argument that there must be something that uh, Vera Rubin called uh, non luminous mass, and that was called uh, dark matter. And uh, very, uh, very exciting thing there. Um, so where is it? Um, you M31 Andromeda is uh, visible in the evening sky uh, now and um, uh, uh, M33 is uh, not too far away uh, close to the Triangulum Galaxy and uh, it's just a bit to the south about uh, 10 degrees further south in declination than Andromeda and uh, it's uh, here's the uh, local group of uh, galaxies. And uh, if we blow in there, you can see M31 and M33 fairly close by. Uh, and so uh, M31 and uh, the Milky Way are a bit larger than M33. Um, but M33 is not as bright. And so if I I, when I looked, uh, got out my uh, Celestron C8 and uh, pointed at M33, this is what I saw. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, this is why I'm not that much of an enthusiast uh, as a visual observer. So I then uh, took uh, my refractor and I took a 60 second exposure um, with a five inch refractor and uh, I don't know if you can see anything there, but there's a little bit of a smudge. And uh, so it, it's a really faint fuzzy, even uh, with the 60 second exposure at ISO six, uh, 1600. This is with a Canon T3A, T3i, an unmodified camera. So if you take about 180 uh, exposures like that and stack them all up, uh, you in Increase the intensity of the light, uh, the intensity of the object, but uh, the associated noise with that is kind of random and it does not increase as much. And so you get an image like this. So this was what he did after six hours of uh, exposure. And uh, so, so that I was, this was my first uh, effort I did um, uh, with um, astrophotography. And uh, so I was quite quite pleased with that actually at the time but it's it's always you, you can try and do something a little bit better well there is a really interesting uh group called the rask astrophotography group and uh, perhaps joe carr can say something about it a little bit later but the other day um dan meek who's a, a rascal from calgary posted this image of the uh, M33 and the hydrogen alpha. And hydrogen alpha is um, gas that uh, is being excited by X-rays or uh, high energy light from uh, usually uh, O-type stars. And uh, it allows them to uh, create an emission nebula. Normally they're colored pink and they're usually embedded with uh, other pictures, so you get a, a nice color there. But in this thing, there's two uh, images uh, that really captured my eye, and I my my pointer won't go to them. Off to the left is a really bright object there, and there's another one, uh, uh, kind of a uh, little bit to the right of the center. Um, so uh, that uh, so what I did is I took Dan's picture, and I embedded it into my picture. And you can see a, a very bright object here, and I'll just back off. And one is called NGC 604, and the other is NGC 595. And those are a lot more active uh, 
than than the other areas around there. So I I was intrigued and I looked into a little bit about NGC 604. And uh, this is a picture from the astronomy picture of the day. And unfortunately, the writing <laughs> is completely obscuring um, all the images of people watching is obscuring the uh, the writing here. But uh, basically, uh, uh, it's a fairly new object. It's only about 300 million uh, years old, uh, 3 million years old. And um, there's enough stars forming in this that it's uh, enough to make a globular cluster. And uh, so a lot of the stars, even only 3 million years old, have grown so rapidly that it has produced supernova already. And uh, the, um, let's see here. Uh, the, the one thing is, is that it is so bright it's 6,300 times brighter than the uh, Orion Nebula. And if it was the same distance as the Orion Nebula, it would be, it would outshine Venus in the sky. So this is kind of getting into the same topic that was presented by Nathan. A really interesting object there. And uh, I think I'll just stop the share there if I can. And There we go. And take it back to you. Hey, Reg, can I just hey, add Reg. a couple of pictures to what you showed? Pardon me? Can I add a couple of pictures to what you showed? Kind sure. Of... It intrigued me what you were talking about, so I... Um... <clears throat> Where are we? Here we go. Just having trouble. Oh, I'm having trouble. Never mind. But you can take that hydrogen alpha and put it on an RGB picture. And it and it looks like someone took a paintbrush and painted red on that portion of the of the picture. Oh, here we go. Can everyone see that? So this was the hydrogen alpha I took. And I think that's one of the objects you were just showed right there. Yep. Right. And so I So that, that's it right there. Now this is a five inch refractor this was taken through, but it just it looks like someone took a red blob of paint and just stuck it on the picture right there. It's, it's so big, that one. That's a beautiful shot, Dave. Thanks for sharing that. I, I, I find that that's the neat thing about this when people share their pictures and you look at it and you start to explore stuff in it, you find real treasures there sometimes. So it it's, it's a lot, makes the hobby even more interesting. Hey, um, Rich. You, yes. I'm sorry. Yeah, that, that is neat. That's one of my favorite objects. But what you need, we all need, is to get out into really dark skies because. You can see those objects. And I, I was been desperately looking for a sketch I did from a nice dark sky at the Oregon Star Party some years ago. I couldn't find it, but it's amazing what you can see when you have a really good sky. So, and it, I'm maybe next week, if I can find, I have a scan of the sketch. I just couldn't find it in a desperate search through my files, but. But it's a wonderful object, and it, it's definitely M33 is something that's fun to go back to. At actually, with any kind of sky, and the darker it is, the more you see. Is always true. Yeah, I, I can remember seeing seeing it about 94, 95. I can remember seeing M33 with a pair of binoculars from Blackfoot. Yeah, mm. yeah. I don't think my eyes are as good as your eyes, and that's one reason I've gone to the to, to astrophotography rather than visual work. So, uh, 
Well, it's hard when we don't have really dark skies and smokeless skies. You can see M33 without optical aid if you have a good sky. If you're. And you have young eyes. Well, even this guy here was what, 78 or 79? When did you know? 78. You've seen it. Yeah. So, but yeah, with binoculars, it's beautiful. And with even small telescopes. Yep. There's also a globular cluster that's not very difficult. It's called 39 or something. And you have to look at a chart to find it. But it's quite easy to find if you have a chart. And it's bright enough to see in a medium-sized telescope. Looks like a star, of course. <laughs> Thanks, Reg and uh, Dave and Dorothy and Miles for comments. Um, John. Okay, uh, I have I have two things to show you, and they're on different computers, so you'll have to bear with me. I'll try the what I know best first. So. I wanted to show you uh, something that we got a picture of a week or so ago up at the BCO and we were just testing out taking pictures with the, uh, the uh, two telescopes. And this picture, the whole screen here is the full frame of a picture taken with the Takahashi. And the, in, the part in the middle is the part I'm going to show you blown up in a second. And that just shows the field size. I won't bother with that. Mm. So what this shows is that the Takahashi can get kind of a nice picture of things that are really pretty far away. And <clears throat> I stupidly said to uh, Reg, when we were doing this, first of all, when we looked at the first frame, we couldn't actually see anything. Wondered if we were in the right place. And then I said, well, they're pretty far away, so maybe, maybe that's the reason. And what I was really after was this group here, which is Stefan's Quintet. Some of you may have looked at this or imaged it before. It's quite a pretty little set of stars. And it's a very favorite of mine because it's part of a Hickson group. And Paul Hickson was a student in one of my classes at Alberta. He's become kind of famous for his Hickson groups of galaxies that are, he sort of identified galaxies that are uh, together, not just in the picture, but in space. So by measuring their distances too. And then down here, this is called the Deer Lick group. And it's got one nice big spiral galaxy and then a bunch of little guys. And I stupidly said, and I thought these guys up in the, in the Stephens Quintet were, were uh, half a billion uh, light years away. That's not true, but it is possibly true of these little guys in this group. They're somewhere between 350 and 500 uh, million light years away. So. The interesting thought is that when we took these, this picture, I'll go back to the beginning one. And if I hadn't put the inset in here, you wouldn't even be able to see that. But these little things in here, the light started out coming toward us uh, at least 300 billion light years away. And I started to think about that because I live in a senior's home and I wanted <laughs> Be able to show this to people here and tell them a few facts about it. And here's a few facts that you can think. Uh, there's one foreground galaxy and four members of that mix in compact group 92. And they will likely merge. Well, they probably already have, of course. But we're seeing the light from a long time ago. And then in the Deer Lick group, uh, you've got these ones that could be quite far away. So I 
to try to make that understandable for the people that I'm talking to here, uh, I just, I found this on the internet. It's some important events in Earth's history. And planet Earth formed, now this may not be terribly important based on Nathan's talk earlier. It's such a small planet. Why would we even bother noticing? But it is where we live, guys. And it formed somewhere around 40, 4,600 million uh, years ago. Uh, if you go down to 350 million, that's when the first land vertebrates evolved. The first dinosaurs didn't appear for more than a, a million years after that. And uh, so we're looking at light. The, the photons that we're getting to the, to the camera had a long way to come to get here. And I, I told Reg they were probably getting kind of tired. That's why they're hard to see. So anyway, that's the first thing that I wanted to show you. Uh, set, I'll just unshare this screen. If you have questions about this one, you can ask them, answer them or ask them now, because I'm gonna show you something completely different in a moment. No questions, okay. So let me share the other screen. This is a, a nebula that is in the Southern Hemisphere. If any of you are lucky enough to get down to, uh, well, if Costa Rica, you can see it, or further south, uh, it's called Eta Carina, and it's quite beautiful. But the reason I want to show it is just that I took this picture quite a long time ago, and I've been learning how to use <clears throat> the program called Pixinsight, which is a, a fancy new program for, for processing images, and it can do some neat things. And you've seen a lot of nice images that... Uh, uh, that have been done with it, but something that you may or not may not have seen is is the following. If I just click on this, I can take the stars out. And if I click on it again, the guys in the astrophotography sig will know about this, but the rest of you may not. It's possible to take the stars out, work on them separately, put them back in, which is what I did here. Because the original image of this, I don't know if I can find it here. Let me just see. The original image was a bit, no, I guess I can't. Maybe I can. Yeah, the original image that I processed in a different way before looked like this, and the stars kind of overwhelmed the image. So by, by, by being able to take them out, or if you want to take them out altogether, <clears throat> that gives you a look at what you would see if you got outside of our Milky Way and looked at this thing. So you wouldn't be looking through all the stars. And that's all I wanted to show. So I'll stop the share. Uh, John, John, could I add just something? You said uh, Stefan's is one of your favorite groups. I think it has to be one of everybody's favorite groups, anyone who has a big enough scope. But one of my favorite groups, I start from Stefan's and go about one degree north to the UGC 12127 galaxy uh -huh. cluster. So if you want to push the limit sometime, try that. It's an okay. even cluster of galaxies, not as tight as Stefan's, but there are about eight or nine galaxies you can see in, a, in the group. Yeah, you should be able to get those with your photography. Yeah, UGC, that's the Uppsala General Catalog, UGC okay. 12127. I will have a look for those. Thank you. A really naive question, which I could ask any photographer, but this Pixinsight program, what's your file format? Are they raw or JPEG or? It, it can handle any of those file formats. Typically, it works with 
its own file format, but it can use FITS or TIFF or even JPEG. It, it will work with just about any file format. Uh huh. So I'm just thinking about removing stars and putting them back in. And my feeble attempts with the dark sky of just getting large, large-scale pictures of a of the sky, mm -hmm. and I could see. Possibly, I never thought it would happen when I've been hearing about the Pixon site, but maybe I should try it. Well, there's, there's a, it's actually a routine called Starnet, but it, there's a version, a free version out there that works outside of Pixon site. So you don't actually have to get Pixon site to use uh -huh. it. If you look for Starnet plus plus, uh huh. Um, there's a standalone that you just feed a TIFF into, and uh, a TIFF file, and it and it removes the stars, and creates a Great. new TIFF. Thank you. Inside of the steep learning curve. Thank you very much. Um, so, Dave, I think we're ready to show the uh, Edmonton photos. So. Sure. Just I'm gonna on. roll them up. Just gonna see where my PowerPoint is. There it is. And so the, so the first image we're gonna see is from Tom Owen from September the 14th. There are two images of the uh, California Nebula, and he's used an 80 mil refractor uh, oh, at f 4.8 uh, QSI CCD, and he's stacked it and processed. Now he's shown us two images, and, and the interesting thing about this is. The, just the one is inverted from the other. So if you slide it up a little bit, you'll be able to see that yeah, I'll they're, the same, they're the same image, but somehow your mind processes them differently. So notice this and then this. Which one do you like? <laughs> so mm. it's funny how your brain processes things differently depending on orientation. So this is the um, the actual orientation, and this is swap uh, flipped, right? Yeah, yeah. Or that's what he captured, I guess I should say, not the yeah. actual. One. Yeah. No. I thought it was fairly interesting that your brain processes things differently depending on the orientation. Uh, and the next one is uh, was a collaboration, uh, and it's several images between uh, Abder and Arnold Rivera. Uh, last Friday and Saturday, that's the September, September 10th and 11th. They were out at the Black Nugget Lake Campground, uh, which is where they held a Northern Prairie Star Party, which is where the big telescope is going. And early Friday evening, they had a short period of oh. clear, clear skies. And this is a secret. What happened was they took the camera off of uh, uh, Arnold's scope and put, put it on Abder's 11 inch scope. And they took a sequence of pictures of Ju Jupiter that shows uh, the rotation of Jupiter a little bit, showing the, the spot, the, the planet shadow that going across. So if you run through those, you'll be able to see the, uh, the difference there. So there's the first one. I've lost a lot of the rest of my email somehow. Second one, third one. Okay, never mind. And uh, fourth I one. And so keep going. The keep going. <laughs> so there's five images there, and you can see the the shadow and the and the moon moving off to the right, and a little bit of rotation in the planet. Hmm. So this is what happens when you get two uh, two good astrophotographers together for an evening. <laughs> yeah, Isn't that beautiful. And then just to add to it, they took this one. <laughs> and that was after, yeah. They got a nice view of Saturn as well. So they're sharing equipment basically, and, and I don't know who did the processing. Yeah. And then the last one is, uh, this is dumb. This is Alistair Ling. He's telling you don't have to go complicated. He says, no tripod, no tracker, just a lens and a tripod, no tracker. 127 two second images with a uh, 135 millimeter F4.5 on a Canon D 5D Mark III at ISO 25600, um, processed in, in the usual stuff, but that's what you can do with limited equipment. 
he of course had to had to stack and rotate and and uh, and do that with start tools rotate and shift in order to get everything lined up but uh which object is that oh that's m31 oh really that's andromeda oh there it is okay yeah. the wrong angle yeah okay <laughs> got it a different angle a different angle just a different angle yeah so Is those who uh, think, so those of you who think you have really need a really expensive mount, <laughs> you can do stuff tricks with software. Yeah, Dave, you didn't mention this. The next to the last point there on the right needs a dark country sky. <laughs> and of course, this was was taken. Uh, I think this was taken out at a new place that they've discovered. It's a little bit north and east of north and west of Edmonton. They yeah, call it. Yeah. I don't think he said the location in the email, did he? No, but I think it was they were out at Stanger Hills, which is a new place they yeah. discovered that's just north of uh, Wabama. And they found that it's it's a little bit darker than what they used to do at Blackfoot. Hmm. That's quite incredible, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's north and west of Edmonton, so there's not a lot of bright stuff north of there. So you might have trouble going south and west, taking pictures south and west of there. But uh, mm. certainly in the northeast, it would be pretty dark. Mm. There you go. Yeah. Well, thank you for my, uh, getting those. And uh, I thought that sequence of Jupiter was really yeah, it's pretty spectacular. <laughs> Great. That was pretty well, cool. Two guys putting their heads together for one evening, sharing equipment yeah. and work. Yeah. yeah, if you have the uh, big enough scope and the, the camera for it, then it all can work out. Yeah. Um, I don't know if anybody else has anything this evening. I actually have something that uh, Nathan inspired me to mention. Okay, Brock, please. Sure. I was just reading a little bit about the Hubble uh, deep field and the ultra deep field. And maybe I want to share something here. So actually, before I say that, I just wanted to start with, if you take a piece of paper and you take a thumbtack and you poke a hole in it, a little bit smaller than a millimeter, and you hold it up at arm's length, actually further, it's about a meter away, and you look through that little hole, that will give you this following view of the sky that Hubble took. Can you guys see that circle? Mm -hmm. So this is just a teeny tiny bit of the sky. It's actually roughly the size of the disk of Jupiter, but there's just nothing but galaxies. Yeah, that's the deep feel here. Yeah. And it's just mind boggling the enormity of space. <laughs> and that's only what we can see. Um, yeah. People 13 billion years on the other side of our limit yeah. are looking back at this and seeing 13 billion years into the past towards us. Yeah. It's pretty mind boggling. Very neat. Does anybody else have anything for this evening? Just a comment. If somebody's on the other side of the universe looking back at us, wondering if we're here, we're not even a twinkle in daddy's eye yet. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> I don't think they're worried about whether we're here. <laughs> they're just They're just trying to figure out the size of the universe the way we are. Yeah. And seeing themselves as very small, unless they are like Fred Hoyle's The Black Cloud, which is a bit bigger. Great. Okay. Um, oh, um, just while we're on the topic, um, there is a makers group meeting on Thursday. Is that correct, Jim? Yes, that's right. So if anybody hasn't gotten the email about that, um, please let Jim know or, or me and I can relay it to him. Um, are there any other uh, SIG groups this week, David? Uh, Chris, 
<clears throat> yes, there's a astrophotography SIG meeting on Wednesday. Okay, so we have Wednesday and Thursday this week. And Sunday at noon at Porter Park, that's Sir James Douglas School, is the fall fair field, the, uh, the fair. We have a table uh, and um, I will send out an email to get final list of who wants to come. I've got the club tent and what's it called? The, the outreach rover, the box of, of pamphlets and things. And uh, we'll be by the parking lot right close to where we would like to be doing our Astro Cafe. Do you know, um, so we're on the um, Thurlow Road side? Yeah, on the Thurlow Road side, uh, just kind of at the corner of the uh, parking lot is where okay. they placed us. Yeah, that and should mostly work. We may have lost the sun by four. Depending no, I went by, I went by, it. it'll be great. Yeah, okay. So I'm sorry, is this near the Moss Street School? It's the yes, that's right. area? Yeah. All yeah. Right. It, we, it's a stone's throw from the uh, hut that we uh, meet Astro Cafe. Excellent, thank you. I'll and when is to... this, uh, Randy? On Sunday, starting at noon, I will get Sunday. there early with the tent. And yeah, uh, but... I'll send out an email. Okay, I, yeah, I hadn't heard about it. It's usually a great event, actually. It's a lot of fun. Great. Randy, are you, are you going to request tables? They usually provide us two tables there. I asked for a table. I didn't ask for two. I can ask for two. So this Sunday coming up. Yes. Yes, indeed. Oh, I'll be here. I'll be delighted. That'd be good. And so, guarantee so, clear skies, right? Yeah. Well, so far, the weather forecast is not unencouraging, so we'll yeah. see. We'll see what she is <laughs> oh, liberal minority government, exactly the same as before, apparently. Yes, if you, so yeah, if you haven't been following it, we're basically where we were before the election, so there you go. Hold the balance of power just like they did already. So nothing happened. Yeah. 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 So anyway, yeah, uh, anything else for this evening? Okay, so there are some uh, SIG groups this week, um, an event on Sunday, and we'll be back on Monday. Thank you very much, Chris. Yeah. Thank so you very much. Take care, everyone, and uh, you have a great week. Good night. Good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.